Hello, my name is Dr. Martin Wensing, and today we're going to be talking about electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, we're going to be focusing on sodium as well as hyperkalemia in this presentation. So by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to know the mechanisms of hyponatremia, hyponatremia, and hyperkalemia, as well as a basic approach to hyponatremia and hyponatremia. Uh, and hyperkalemia. We'll also be touching on the management of hyperkalemia. So we'll start with hyponatremia. So hyponatremia is a simple definition of when you have a plasma sodium concentration greater than 145 millimole per liter. So the mechanism, so hyponatremia occurs secondary to unreplaced water, water loss into cells, or sodium overload. So with unreplaced water, this can be from skin losses, uh, such as sweat or transepidermal diffusion, GI losses or urinary losses. So subclassifying that with, within urinary losses, uh, one cause is central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which occurs secondary to a decreased release of or renal resistance to ADH, resulting in excretion of dilute urine. Second potential subclassification here is of osmotic diuresis. Now that occurs secondary to non-reabsorbed non-electrolyte solutes such as glucose or mannitol. Now the f another within the unreplaced water section we have uh, hypothalamic lesion, which is affecting first or also osmoreceptor function. So the second large section is water loss into cells. Now this occurs uh, transiently following severe exercise or electroshock induced seizures, secondary to increased cell osmolality. Regarding these, uh, the electroshock induced seizures, this is thought to occur due to breakdown of large complex organic molecules into numerous smaller components. Finally, we have sodium overload. Now this can occur either through salt poisoning, which can be accidental or non-accidental, or through iatrogenic sodium loading, such as giving uh, IV, IV normal saline or IV solutions which are hypertonic with high, high levels of sodium. Now clinical features, so early symptoms are kind of non-specific, first weakness, loss of appetite, nausea, orthostatic hypertension, and then the severe symptoms are also a bit non-specific, but seizures, stupor, coma, intracranial hemorrhage, or death. Uh, you should have a high level of suspicion in older populations, nursing home residents, and during hospital admission, in particular for those uh, aforementioned population groups. Evaluation. Um, so there's really two key investigations uh, when you're evaluating hyponatremia that you'd want to order, and that's serum osmolality and urine osmolality. The third investigation is urine sodium, which is used at times. So if the urine osmolality is low or intermediate, then this is how you want to consider things. Now, if the urine osmolality is less than the plasma osmolality, then the diagnosis is either central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now to differentiate central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, you can do a ADH administration test. Now, in central diabetes insipidus, the administration of ADH will increase the urine osmolality. However, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there will be no effect as the ADH levels in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus are preserved and they're not the issue. It is rather the uh, kidneys response to the ADH. Now, if the urine osmol is intermediate, so 300 to 600, then you're considering osmotic diuretis, diuresis, or diabetes insipidus. Now, the osmotic diuresis can be confirmed by 
measuring the total solute excretion uh, and a value greater than 1000 suggests osmotic diuresis otherwise the the cause would be diabetes insipidus again finally if the urine osmolality is high and clinically the patient has a history which is consistent with and an examination which is consistent with dehydration then the cause is most likely extra renal water loss and you would treat that with hypotonic fluids and then subsequently measure remeasure the urine and plasma osmolality at this stage if the urine osmolality becomes dilute while the plasma osmolality remains elevated then the diagnosis is partial diabetes insipidus but if the urine osmolality remains greater than 600 as in we have functioning kidneys then losses uh, sodium overload or primary first defect is the cause now to differentiate between those different causes you look at the urine sodium now if the urine sodium is less than 25 then volume depletion or water loss is the cause and if the urine sodium is greater than 100 then salt ingestion or infusion of hypertonic sodium solution is the cause given that elevated sodium okay so now let's move on to hyponatremia so hyponatremia is defined by a sodium concentration of below 135. now the mechanism depends on what type of hyponatremia because hyponatremia is subclassified into hypertonic isotonic or hypotonic hyponatremia so hypertonic hyponatremia occurs secondary to a excess osmolites such as glucose or mannitol levels causing a shift of water intracellularly to extracellularly and therefore diluting the extracellular sodium level isotonic hyponatremia occurs as a result of a laboratory artifact or error and it occurs in the presence of high proteins or lipids this occurs secondary to the way that sodium is measured in the laboratory and it's measured in plasma under the presumption that 93 percent of plasma is water however in these states of high proteins lipids or glucose the proportion of water decreases and therefore the concentration of the sodium in the water although remaining unchanged decreases due to the assumption that that water composes 93 percent of the plasma volume and therefore you get that miscalculation hypotonic hyponatremia encompasses all other causes of hyponatremia and we'll further go through these different causes based on that separate subclassification so the first one is hypovolemic hyponatremia and just so you have an overview the other two are euvolemic hyponatremia and our final one will be hypervolemic hyponatremia so the first one is hypovolemic hyponatremia and we have a few different causes that can result in this one is diuretics and they do this through volume loss stimulating adh leading to water retention and potassium loss which contributes to a sodium shift intracellularly secondly we have salt wasting nephropathy where you have intrinsic renal disease causing the excessive sodium loss cerebral salt wasting uh, which occurs secondary to numerous intracranial pathologies but the mechanism as to why it occurs is still unknown then we have mineralocorticoid deficiency where decreased aldosterone results in increased renal sodium loss and then we have iatrogenic 
due to replacement of fluid losses with hypotonic oral or IV fluid. Now we'll move on to uvolemic hyponatremia. So syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Now this results from dysregulation of cells which produce ADH or from ectopic ADH secretion. ADH then causes increased renal water reabsorption. Now this can result from drugs, CNS injury, ADH secreting tumors, lung disease, or idiopathically. We have iatrogenic as again. Now this can be from a post-surgical transient increase in ADH, hypotonic fluid use, or absorption of fluid without solute uh, when hypotonic fluids are used in surgery, such as during uh, bladder irrigation. Then we have psychogenic polydipsia. Now this is excessive oral fluid intake due to a sensation of a persistently dry mouth. Beer drinkers potomania. Now this occurs due to inadequate salt and protein intake. Uh, with a subsequent fall of the urea and electrolytes in the urine and therefore impaired ability of the kidney to excrete free water. Hypovolemic hyponatremia. So this occurs secondary to either chronic renal failure, congestive cardiac failure, liver cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome, uh, all of which are associated with a hypovolemic status. Now, in chronic renal failure, it occurs from inability to excrete sodium and then subsequent expansion in total body water volume. In congestive cardiac failure, the systemic hypoperfusion results in activation of the RAS, ADH, and norepinephrine, um, which all act on the kidney to decrease sodium and water excretion. Uh, resulting then in the hypervolemic state and the low sodium in a attempt to uh, increase perfusion. Uh, in liver cirrhosis, we have decreased protein production, which leads to fluid loss from the intervascular compartment, as per Starling's laws, and subsequently hypertension. Uh, which is also exacerbated by persistent vasodilation, which is seen in cirrhosis. This then stimulates ADH secretion, uh, which works on the renal system to decrease water excretion, uh, further leading to the hypervolemic status and hyponatremia. Finally, in nephrotic syndrome, it's somewhat similar to liver cirrhosis in that um, the main contributor is the loss of protein. So in this scenario, proteins are lost through ineffective, uh, an ineffective renal system and it's lost in, lost in the urine, which results in activation of ADH and water retention and hence hyper, hypervolemic hyponatremia, similar to liver cirrhosis. So just general clinical features for all of these. Uh, nausea and vomiting, confusion, headache, balance, difficulties, and as it gets more severe, altered mental status, seizures, and coma. Um, there are obviously other symptoms or clinical features depending on the underlying cause. Now, evaluation. So you start off by looking at the serum osmolality. Now, if the serum osmolality is normal, then you consider pseudohyponatremia in which case you assess for hyperproteinuria and hyperlipidemia. And if one of those is elevated, then you've got your cause. If the serum osmolality is high, look for hyperglycemia and check for recent mannitol or solbitol or recent contrast load, as this might be a, from osmotic diuresis. Then if the serum osmolality is low, as in less than 280, you want to do an evaluation of the patient's uh, volume status. You start by looking, uh, if they're hypervolemic, you start by looking at the urinary sodium. If the sodium is greater than 20, then 
the renal system is being acted on by either diuretics or mineralocorticoid deficiency. If their urinary sodium is less than 20, then it's from extra renal losses, such as vomiting, diarrhea, or third spacing. If the patient is uvolemic, in this scenario, the urinary sodium is typically greater than 80. You want to look at the urine osmolality. And if the urine osmolality is greater than 100, then, look, then you're considering things such as SI, ADH, hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, insufficiency, stress, or drug use. If the urine osmolality is less than 100, then it's primary, then the causes are likely primary polydipsia or beer potomania syndrome. Finally, if the patient is hypervolemic, you again look at the urinary sodium. And if the urinary sodium is less than 20, then the causes are heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrosis, or hypoalbuminemia. If the urinary sodium is greater than 20, then the cause is renal failure. So now we've finished with sodium, and let's look at hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia, the definition I've grouped into moderate and significant hyperkalemia. So moderate is uh, when the potassium value is between five to six, and significant is when the potassium value is greater than six. So the mechanism, so it can either occur secondary to increased intake with associated decreased renal excretion of potassium, just from decreased excretion of potassium, from decreased cellular entry or increased cellular exit or increased cellular turnover. With decreased excretion of potassium, this can go occur secondary to renal insufficiency. And you start to see this when the EGFR falls below 60, but it becomes more significant when the EGFR is below 30. Low sodium diets. Um, now, this is because sodium facilitates potassium excretion. Adrenal causes, so from decreased aldosterone excretion leading to decreased potassium excretion. And similarly, pseudo-hypoaldosteronism, in which case the renal tubules are unresponsive to aldosterone. And then finally, from drugs such as potassium-sparing diuretics. ACs, ARBs, direct renin inhibitors, NSAIDs, trimethoprim, heparin, and calcineurin inhibitors. Finally, you want to have a look at uh, find another cause then is decreased cellular entry or increased cellular exit. And this occurs in response to osmotic gradients, can occur in response to osmotic gradients with hyperosmolality secondary to mannitol or hyperglycemia, can occur secondary to insulin deficiency or beta, block, beta agonist blockade, as both of these facilitate entry of potassium into the cell. Digoxin overdose, as it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase, or saxomophonium in patients with neuromuscular disease. Finally, increased cell turnover can occur secondary to strenuous exercise or to uh, cell damage in rhabdomyolysis or tumor lysis syndrome, causing a result, uh, subsequent release of potassium. So the clinical features, so there's, again, non-specific symptoms, muscle weakness, abdo pain, diarrhea, chest pain, palpitations, numbness, nausea, and vomiting. More importantly, if you have a, a patient who returns their result for hypokalemia, you want to then do an ECG because your ECG changes is important in, in determining how quickly you want to manage this patient and how aggressively you want to manage this patient. So the, some of the EC changes to look for are peaked T waves, P wave flattening or widening, a PR prolongation, uh, new bradyarrhythmias, new conduction blocks, um, QRS widening with abnormal QRS pathology. Now, on to the management. So if you see any of those ECG changes, it is 
imperative that you quickly give calcium chloride or calcium gluconate to stabilize the cardiac membrane, the cardiac cell membrane, and that is 10 mil of 10% uh, IV. Uh, it's important to note that chloride only has 2.2 millimoles of calcium, while gluconate has 6.8 millimoles of calcium. Then you want to drive potassium into the cells from the extravas intravascular space. Now you can do this. You want to first give 50 mils of 50% dextrose and then give 10 units of IV act act rapid insulin, which moves that potassium intracellularly and tends to decrease the serum potassium by one millimole. The reason you give the dextrose first is that you don't want to cause a hypoglycemic episode. You can give neb nebulized salbutamol, five milligrams times two, and that will reduce the serum potassium by approximately 0 0.8 millimoles. Sodium bicarbonate, 50 mils of 8.4% can be given, but only if the patient is acidotic. Otherwise, it's not clinically indicated. Finally, you can increase potassium excretion. Now, this is not going to, in the case of rhizonium, not going to affect the potassium levels acutely, but will decrease it over a longer period of time. So you can give calcium rhizonium 30 to 60 grams, either orally or rectally, every four to six hours. Hemodialysis is a definitive treatment of hyperkalemia. And in a patient who has severe hyperkalemia, it should be considered. Finally, diuresis uh, with fruzamide, as well as giving IVF to promote diuresis will also decrease the serum potassium level. So for my information, I used BMJ up to date, Life in the Fast Lane, and then the Emergency Care Institute with the ACI website. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your time.